Um, first of all, thanks for coming. I would not come to a talk this late, so dedication is high in this room. So thank you for that. Um, everybody, I think, has been uh, giving the same initial slides. Please rate this talk. Um, yep, please rate this talk afterward if you are inclined. Uh, so let's, uh, let's kick this off. So my name is Sten Anderson, and I work for CME Group here in Chicago, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, I work for, the exchange is a the largest financial derivatives exchange in the world. Um, generally a very risk averse place to work. Generally a Java shop. Hard to introduce new technology, but possible. And that's what this talk is about. Um, my journey with bringing technology like Scala, specifically Scala, into a generally risk averse corporate environment. Uh, this is not a case study. This is the last I'll actually pretty much talk about CME specifically. Uh, this, the opinions here are my own. Uh, it should go without saying uh, in any talk that um, uh, I don't represent my company here. Uh, so anything uh, controversial or um, questionable can be pinned uh, directly on me. So um, I guess, I assume this is a Scala conference, so everybody has some familiarity with Scala. Is that fairly accurate? Um, what about Java? I, I, did you guys come through Scala by way of Java? Yeah, so I, I did that too. I am a dyed-in-the-wool Java guy. I'm, I'm going on 20 years with Java. And uh, I kind of came through Scala, or through uh, Java into Scala. Um, and this is the first Scala conference I've been a part of. And it's refreshing to go to a conference that's completely Scala. If you're wondering kind of what skill level of Scala we'll be talking about here, um, if you uh, saw Martin's keynote last night, which was excellent, he's a great teacher. Um, if you had any of this kind of reaction, which is Homer watching Twin, Pe Twin Peaks, um, you're in the right place. So we're not gonna be talking about implicits. We're not gonna be talking about advanced Scala features. We are going to be more recognizing that, brilliant, there's a lot going on here, and I have no idea what's going on. So uh, this is not a deep dive into Scala. This is the beginner track. Uh, and this is not a code heavy uh, session. Um, so an alternate uh, title for this talk was build yourself a Scala team in five years or more. Figured that wouldn't get through as much. Um, but that really is kind of the journey we're, we're talking about here. This is a long, arduous, and at times very unrewarding thing to do is to try to uh, penetrate a new, um, inject a new language or technology like Scala into a very corporate environment. Uh, so I promise this is the only bullet pointed slide here. Um, th these, are, these are very t um, visual slides, not a whole lot of text. Um, but just to level set what we're talking about here, um, we, I, I want to identify what I mean by a corporate environment because that means different things to different people. Um, and then why I care about Scala at all. Uh, and then provided we pass through those two gates um, that we want to do Scala and we know what kind of corporate environment we're talking about. Um, how can we win over our peers, our management, uh, and the environment ourselves itself? Um, so let's dive right into that. Uh, presumably we're all employed and we all have uh, at a company, maybe a corporation, maybe not, uh, and you have some role to play in there. Maybe you're the CTO of a startup and if uh, this is where you work, um, I will not be offended if you walk out because this talk will be not relevant to you. Um, if you have complete control over your technology stack and you can uh, tell your developers what you want to do without question and you get full buy-in from management or you are management, um, you will not get uh, as much out of this talk. However, uh, if you uh, are uh, familiar with the um, soul-sucking uh, fluorescent lights, um, you know, please, please stay. So, um, but even this corporate environment is a little too, um, this is a little too stale and it would be difficult to introduce anything into this. This is more of the sweet spot. So this is a corporation that's probably been here, um, but is now realizing that open floor plans are a good thing. Everybody likes Aeron, Herman Miller chairs. Um, nobody's sitting in these yet, but they've built it out and it's kind of ready to go. They probably have an innovation lab 
and it probably says innovation lab and you can go and innovate there for a couple hours a day on your on your own time um, so like kind of a corporation that's working up to the industry buzzwords anyway um, so you know because it's the end of the day it's time time to laugh a little bit hopefully um, uh, I'm not sure, I know a lot of people are here from out of town, but in the Midwest especially, and uh, the, uh, the Onion is a popular satirical uh, paper. I want to say fake news, but that means something else nowadays. That's this isn't fake news. Um, so uh, I, I want to describe the corporate environment I'm talking about in uh, satirical Onion headlines. If you find yourself chuckling at them, then uh, you're in the right place. So let's get right into that. So a manager accidentally refers to his team as agile without using air quotes. If that is something that you at all relate to, the overuse of the word agile, then you're in the right place. Data scientist discovers that big data is really just regular sized data, but more of it. Uh, information security accidentally creates password policy so complex it opens a portal to the upside down. This is a Stranger Things thing. If you haven't seen Stranger Things, it won't be funny. So, um, but password policies are, are complex. Developer puts getting new Mac from IT right up there with the birth of first child as one of life's best moments. Uh, the new Macs are very slick, so it's understandable. Uh, and then finally, and thank you for bearing with this, uh, manager disappointed that management dashboard is really just another boring list, not an actual dashboard. So um, if you've dealt with management dashboards at all, or managers that say like, I just want a dashboard of this stuff, um, that's, that's very, very appropriate. Um, so, you, so if you relate to any of that or understand any of that, this is where you're going to probably find yourself. On an org chart somewhere, definitely not at the top, um, probably somewhere toward the bottom or, or, or middle if, if, if you're lucky. So this is kind of who you are and where you work or have been able to uh, relate to that. So before we talk about how to get stuff in there, it might be worthwhile to ask uh, why Scala at all, right? So um, this talk actually has a number of different flavors. Uh, the, the flavor of this talk will not dive a lot into why you would want to use Scala because you are here at a Scala conference. You've probably answered that for yourself uh, in, in your quiet moments. So, um, but let's talk about it anyway because um, selling to others is an important part of the whole process. Uh, so let's take a small segue and talk about Chuck Cloisterman. So Chuck Cloisterman, anybody familiar with him? He writes about, um, okay, one person thing. He writes about um, uh, popular, uh, popular culture. He writes essays about pop culture. Um, so, uh, you know, like uh, the death of rock and roll and all these other things. Uh, so in his latest book, which is intentionally upside down, that's not a, that's just, that's this, he's a quirky guy. Uh, but what if we're wrong? He, uh, he asks the question, um, hundreds of years from now, long after the genre of rock and roll is dead, who will we remember as a quintessential rock and roller? And he argues that there will be one, and in the middle of the rock and roll genre, as we are right now, there, it's easy for us to say, like, what are you talking about? E even all these artists right here, I mean, Beyonce and Hendrix are nothing alike. Um, how could we distill the entire genre into one pers quintessential person? But uh, he argues we do this all the time. So classical, which, spanned, which has spanned hundreds more years than rock has, we've already started narrowing it down. Um, can anybody name more than three people on here, for example? It's just rhetorical. You don't have to actually do it. But, um, but this was about all I could do, right? So these are the heavy hitters of classical, but there are a lot more than this. Uh, and certainly in the day when Baroque music would have been very popular, uh, there were uh, a lot of different uh, composers, I'm sure. Um, so we do it even outside of, uh, of things like music. Anybody know who this, who this cat is? Yeah, this is Edison. What did Edison do? A lot, right? <laughs> that's, that's a, that's, that is the correct answer. So he did a lot, but what do we popularly remember him for? The invention of the light bulb, right? But he didn't invent the light bulb, but we do attribute to that to him. He also didn't invent the power grid. He didn't invent AC or DC power. Uh, he didn't invent the telegraph, which for some reason we attribute to him as well. We attribute all those things to Edison because it's convenient and we like to, um, 
we like to, we don't want to remember all the other people. We barely have room for, uh, for Tesla in there as like a contemporary, um, but no more than that, really. I mean, that's about as much capacity as we have to remember a guy who did power, right? Uh, so, but, but you're right, Edison was, he was a prolific event, inventor and businessman. He popularized a lot of the stuff. He didn't invent it, though. So, um, so what Cloisterman would say is uh, we aren't, because we're in the middle of rock, I'm still talking about rock, I know, right? But it's after six, so it's right. So um, because we're in the middle of the genre, we are not in a position, we can't even guess who's gonna be the most influential rocker, but we can, we are in a position to say who the last will be. And he says the last rock and roller is Eddie Van Halen. So I happen to be a fan of Eddie Van Halen, and so I had to twist him into the talk somehow. Uh, and this is going somewhere. Um, but he's saying there, of course, will be more bands. There, of course, will be better guitarists after Eddie. There will be more popular bands probably after Eddie, but there will not be another Eddie Van Halen. There will not be another one that, another person that captured the imagination of, um, of teenage boys who wanted to learn the guitar in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so he is the last, his essay is called Eddie Van Halen is the last guitar hero. So, awkward segue. Uh, just like, uh, like we're talking about who the last is of a genre, there are a lot of languages, and at some point, there will be a last programming language. There will be a language, thank you for laughing. Uh, there will be a last programming language at some point. No, I'm serious, thank you for laughing. Um, uh, we don't know what that's going to be yet, but at some point, computers will probably start programming, programming themselves. The von Neumann architecture isn't going to be relevant for us anymore, uh, so there'll be a last program, programming language. It'll be something else at some point. Of course, we are in the middle of it right now, so we can't say what the quintessential programming language is yet, but similar to the rock analogy, I say, based on that cognitive bias slide that was in the beginning, we are in a position to know what the last programming language is, not the quintessential one, but the last one. We are, I think, now at a point where the programming zeitgeist has moved on to a point where there will never be a single dominant language again. And what is that language, do you think? It's not Scala. So, uh, and, uh, so I, I submit to you that Java is the last dominant language that we will ever see. Um, for better or worse. Uh, and part of it is uh, it kind of dug its own grave in a way. So Java is a design by language or design by committee language. It is a, uh, I mean, they, you, all you need to do is look at how long it took them to decide on the Lambda Im implementation, right? They had like the three competing uh, Lambda implementations, uh, years, and I think they even delayed a major version before they actually got it in. Um, so Java, is dominant now, but its 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 dominance has now bit it, and it will not. Uh, its innovation is kind of stalled, and it's not going to be. It'll always be around, like COBOL is still around and C is still around, but it's not the innovative language anymore. And in fact, it ruined it for other languages going forward. And the reason is because of this convenient screenshot from 1997, which I knew 20 years ago. I was going to give this talk, so I, I snapped it then. It was the portability of the, of the VM, right? So at the time, in 1997, it was this novel idea, like, what, what, what's the tagline? What's the sales sh sheet for uh, Java? What's the tagline for Java? Right, right once, run, run anywhere, right? So that was, that was shorthand for the JVM. And uh, kind of as the years went on, and this is a famous kind of, I mean, Charles Nutter is, famous for um, pimping this idea. Uh, so this is semi-dated, semi but still relevant. Um, as the years went on, people realized this, this VM, like Java the language, actually kind of blows. But the, v, the underlying VM, the underlying platform, is, is, its, uh, is its diamond in the rough. Um, and because of this, um, you know, and I don't need to read it, but um, the just-in-time compiler, the fast memory allocation, the garbage collection, fully native thread support. They're all billion dollar investments. I mean, centuries of man, manpower have gone into the intellectual property all sitting on our desktops for free. So um, because of the JVM and what Java brought with it, 
Uh, there will never be a single dominant language again. And because of that, we now, we now brag about being polyglot, polyglot programmers, right? So we're in the age of the polyglot programmer now. And it's very popular for people to say, like, well, I'm a polyglot programmer, right? You know, the right language for the right job, right? I mean, that's a very uh, common thing to say. Um, but, um, but I'm old and, and, and cranky, and I, I think that's a nice thing to say, but I think polyglotism is really difficult to achieve. It's really easy to learn Scala as a Java programmer. It's really easy to write Scala as, as if you're writing Java. It's very difficult to write idiomatic Scala, and I, th I think most people would agree with that. Um, it's very easy to write Groovy, like Java. It's very difficult to write idiomatic Groovy, or it's more difficult. It's more of an investment. So what I feel like when people say, oh, yeah, I'm a polyglot. I learn a language every year. I know 20 languages. I, th I sense what they mean is I know a language, like C, my, my core language, C Sharp, Java, something like that. Uh, and I write all my other languages kind of like my home language. Um, uh, that's, not, that's not a truism across the board. Uh, there are definitely people who put in the effort and uh, do really well by it. I've just personally found it very difficult. Um, and part of the reason is that we keep looking at the same problems as if they're different problems. But, it, but in reality, it's the same problem looking at it a different way. And this is classic object-oriented versus functional programming, right? Object-oriented programming, um, which I would kind of cut my teeth on going, going through the, the late 80s and early 90s. Um, you know, all the books of the time were like, it's so obvious. The world is a world of nouns. So everything's an object. Object-oriented programming perfectly models the world around you. Um, but that's, that's, that's not true. Um, and we spend a, a decade or more unwinding all of that because we don't live in a world of things necessarily. We also live in a world of action and um, nuance. So uh, one of the things that uh, this Venn diagram that I kind of shoehorned in uh, is these are the things that I've kind of noticed over the t past 20 years. You know, the, the concept of the enterprise didn't exist when I started working. Uh, it seemed like as Java grew in popularity, uh, enterprise kind of grew in popularity, and then things had to be enterprisey. And actually, the, ad the adverb enterprisey entered the, our lexicon, usually as an insult. Uh, we had this over, uh, overall object-oriented idea that we were trying to um, uh, play with. But then, um, as, as when you get any dominant force, you always get the, you know, the yin to the yang, right? Something else comes out of the gutter and says, like, wait, functional programming. It's been around since the 50s. Uh, it's just as valid a, a way of looking at the world. Here comes Lisp again. Um, and, uh, and it became cool to hate on object-oriented programming and uh, love uh, functional programming. And then you know, we get these intersections here in the Java world. Obviously, in the C-sharp world, this would be a different talk. But um, you know, if uh, and by enterprise here, I mean a language that you won't be afraid to bring home to your parents, right? So uh, although closure arguably is not, uh, it's, it's weird, it's just weird. Um, but anyway, certainly closure is enterprisey uh, and functional, um, and you know, Java is obviously object-oriented and enterprisey. Uh, I just had to look up another one that was not enterprisey and fit in the Java ecosphere, and I guess extend is that way, um, but I've, I don't know anything about it. Uh, and um, because this is a Scala conference, I put Scala in the middle. Uh, when, I, when I give this talk at the, the Microsoft, I put C Sharp in the middle, so no, no I don't do that. All right, so, uh, so the title of this talk is, is a play on the word, uh, play on the phrase deus ex machina, which means um, God out of the machine, which, uh, is referring to the literary device of you've got a, a nice little plot going in your play or, or whatever it is, and uh, all of a sudden something comes out of left field and either resolves all the loose ends or something unexpected happens, comes out from outside of the world, the established world. It's a god out of the machine. Um, so I called this deus ex scala to kind of say, um, you know, and again, this is kind of this personal journey. Over the last 20 years or so, as I've watched Java take, you know, 
get rise in popularity, kind of take over the enterprise, uh, and then fracture with the polyglotism of um, a lot of the cool guys going over to Ruby because they don't like Java. Um, Haskell's doing a little bit over here. C Sharp and you know Microsoft, they're making a, a bid for domination. Um, you kind of out of nowhere, not out of nowhere, but um, it fits with the metaphor. So let's just say out of nowhere. Um, you know, Scala, it slowly builds momentum. And Scala is an old language. It's been around for a while, almost as long as Java. Um, but it's doing it, it by, in kind of on its own terms. And uh, um, I don't want to say it's not selling out, because that implies Java is selling out. But um, it's kind of on its own terms, building its own community, slow and steady, but definitely steady. Um, and what I, uh, this slide doesn't fit as well into this um, um, conference because you're, you're here because you like Scala. Um, but in, in other venues, uh, and, and in this one, I would say Scala is worth your time to learn. I've learned it at least seven times myself, uh, which means that Scala is difficult uh, to learn. And, if, and like anything, if you don't keep using it, uh, you'll forget it. And, and I found myself uh, trying to, uh, in the companies I've worked for, trying to adopt Scala, getting a project going, but then Java takes over again for a while, and then someone's like, oh yeah, that Scala project, that needs help again. I'm like, oh man, how does that, how does that work again? And I end up relearning uh, the whole thing again. But um, I appreciate, as difficult as Scala can be to learn, I, and I'm talking about idiomatic Scala. I'm not just saying like, here's the for statement in Java, here's a for statement in, in, in Scala. But you know, to, to code idiomatic Scala, I like the philosophy of Scala. I want Scala to do well. Um, because, and these slides are taken from last year's Scala Days, um, I think. Um, but th this, I, I believe this comes from Martin. And he, uh, he, he says here, and I, I circled that, um, he, one of the goals for the language is to stay simple and approachable. That is a great noble goal. Scala is a very small syntactic language. Uh, and one of the reasons is they're not afraid to drop features. They, they're dropping stuff all the time. And, and I mean, what happens when you know, Scala 2.10 comes out, uh, everything breaks, right? And then Scala 2.11 comes out, everything breaks again. Um, but that's great. Um, Java, go, because they're so enterprise and so in, entrenched in everything, they, they value backwards compatibility of, above all else. They are afraid, they're terrified. And Windows 95 did the same, or, or the Windows um, s legacy did the same exact thing, which is why everybody kind of you know, looks askance at, at Windows. Um, I think Joel Spolsky says, because he was on the Win uh, well, he was at, at Microsoft for a while, uh, he said Windows 95, the operating system actually had code to check to see if SimCity was running, because it was such a popular game at the time, and if it was running, to pretend its memory model looked a certain way. So the operating system itself had code for a game at the time. Like that, that is hardcore backwards compatibility. Uh, and Java, uh, Java suffers from the same thing, right? And I think this came up in one of the earlier sessions. You can't have both. You can't have a small, uh, compact, simple language and backwards compatibility. Choose one. Uh, and I think Scala makes the right choice here. And one of the other reasons uh, uh, about that is it's not only a simple language, but it's a, it's a quality language, right? So these are two guitars. Uh, uh, really, I just wanted to talk about rock, apparently. <laughs> so I own both these guitars. Um, the one on the right is a PRS Custom 22. The one on the left is a GNL. Um, it's a, basically a, a, like a Stratocaster. Um, one is four times more expensive than the other. The PRS is four times more expensive. Um, but uh, in just looking at them and maybe even listening to them, you'd be like, well, that's a ripoff. But you, uh, you put it on, and there's no question which one is the better of the two. Uh, it just feels right. You know, the, the, the fretboard, everything about the, um, the PRS makes you want to play longer. And that's what I feel like Scala has for me personally. When I use Scala, I want to actually code, and I want to actually do more of it. Whereas Java, it gets the job done, you know, like the GNL here, 
but I'm ready to kind of stop after a little while, right? So um, this, is a, uh, this is an example of, of the quality of, of Scala. And, and again, I know you guys are, are, are established Scala experts, so I won't dwell on this. But one of the quality things about Scala that um, I, I preach to our teams all the time is um, everything is an object, right? So uh, not only is everything in an, an object, but you know, five plus two, that's not, uh, that's not operator overloading. That's just the plus method. And it's, it's the short form for five dot plus two. Um, even null is an object. And uh, you, you get that with, the, with, with numbers, right? So in Java, everything is not an object. You have primitives. And if you're a Java programmer, the first thing you say is like, well, no, there's autoboxing, so joke's on you. Um, but of course, that's not true. Autoboxing is broken all over the place. Uh, and as a quick example, the one on the left is, is Scala. You, you declare an int and a long, and, you, and do they equal each other? They, they do, because it's obvious. Uh, on the right is, is Java. Um, you declare an int and a long. Do they double equals each other? That's a compiler error. Um, do they dot equals e each other? They happen to, but you might get a null pointer exception. Um, you know, the bottom one, just even dealing with integers, with actual objects, um, declare two as 10, uh, two ints as 10. Uh, do they equal? Do they double equals each other? They do. Now reassign them to a thousand. Do they double equal each other? They won't. Does anybody know why that is? By the way. So, uh, it, sorry. Yeah. So it's. Uh, um, I don't mean to pick on Java, but it's 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 an exemplary of the um, uh, the backwards compatibility issue, right? So the the fact that they're so afraid. Or, or, or have just not afraid, but have decided to not break things, um, that they, they kind of just let this go. And the answer to this is, well, well don't ever use double equals, right? You got to use dot equals. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a poor answer. Um, the reason that, that this is the way it is uh, is because um, integers are pooled below a, certain, uh, um, bef below a certain value, which I think is some sort of power of two, like one. 128 or 256 or something. And of course, double equals is not comparing their equality. It's comparing their object reference equality. So that's why it works. Below a certain threshold, they happen to be the same object. Above a certain number, they are not the same object. So that is not what you expect uh, unless you are a Java compiler nerd. So um, all right, so enough about that. You're, you you want to use Scala. I mean, who doesn't, right? So. I, I want to use Scala. I want to use it in my corporation. What do, you know? What's the first step? So the first step is, um, and uh, um, I met uh, Wander earlier uh, yesterday, and, and he had said like, I'm the only guy doing Scala, uh, and I completely and utterly commiserate and relate to that. Uh, and I will say that it is the hardest path to follow to be the Scala guy. It is dangerous. It is. Uh, it's not dangerous. Um, it's just lonely. It's lonely and a lot of work because you will be the Scala guy doing stuff uh, on your uh, own time for the most part. Uh, and you might have to do your day job too. Um, and more than anything, you're going to have to deal with the Ehrlich Bachmans of the world. So, and, and, and if, you know, if you've seen Silicon Valley and you know Ehrlich Bachman's voice, it's most helpful if you read it in his voice. So I bet you feel foolish now for being the Scala guy now that Java 8 has lambdas. So uh, somebody actually said this to me at work a few years ago when, when Java 8 got lambdas. So I mean, you, you basically, you, become, you can become a caricature of the Scala guy, right? Um, and you, you deal with a lot of open hostility and a lot of dismissiveness too, right? Um, no one's heard this, right? I mean, that's not, no, of course, right? I mean, that's, that's like the number one thing on, on Stack Overflow or anything is like, Oh yeah, I looked at Scala for five minutes, too academic. Uh, and things like this don't help our cause at all. Um, when we answer questions to uh, what's the for loop in Scala, when we get answers like this, um, I kind of understand why people are saying it's academic. Um, I, yeah, don't read it. I mean, it's perfectly sensible and all that. But if you, if you don't know what any of this means, 
uh, you will either be immediately turned off or you feel like you've got to look a lot of stuff up. Um, and part of that is uh, the academic nature or the academic criticism uh, is that I feel like James Gosling was kind of like the blue, the blue collar programmer, right? And he even, set, he even calls, this is very early in Java's life in the 90s, um, Java is a blue collar language. Like it, get, it's, it gets stuff done. It's, no one's gonna get their PhD on, on Java, although I'm sure people have. Um, but at the time he was probably thinking like, this is a, work, this is a workman's language. Um, and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna deal too much with the theoretical under, underpinnings of language. Um, but I kind of feel like the criticism of a language being too academic is a little bit like, um, well, it's almost like telling your doctor, um, I'm sorry, doctor, I think, I think you're too qualified to operate on me. Like it's kind of, uh, it's a weird backhanded, like you're too good for this. Um, I, I don't own a sports car, but on the rare occasion I've sat in them or, or, or driven them or watched them being driven um, with a tear in my eye, um, no, uh, that uh, it, it's a lot like a, a sports car, right? So if you've ever driven a sports car, uh, it's not, they handle really well, but you gotta know what you're doing because they handle really well, they go really fast, and they don't have time for you. Like you need to know what you're doing. And that's a little bit, I would call, the academia of, of, of Scala. Like, Scala's not going to make apologies for being elegant and awesome and having a strong theoretical underpinning, um, just like a BMW is not going to apologize for, for its handling. But you get in the car, and everything is about as you expect. And that's what I experienced with Scala. And that's, that's what I feel like a lot of the people that have kind of uh, convinced over into Scala have noticed as well that things operate about as you would expect. Like with the int thing with Java, that is a, that's a, I did not expect that. I did not expect a thousand to not equal a thousand. Um, but with Scala, there isn't that kind of, of thing. Um, and we're kind of fooling ourselves if we, conv if we, say, if we say that, um, that Scala is, or that Java is not complex. We just have grown accustomed to all the accidental complexity. So here's a typical stack trace from an application container, and in yellow is the actual business logic you care about. So uh, we're totally fine with this as Java programmers. We just skip through the first few pages. We, we skip through all the org Apache stuff until we find com.cme or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's, that's where I am. Um, that is, uh, it's not like Scala doesn't have this, but, um, we, we can't pretend that Java is some sort of elegant, um, simple, straightforward thing. Uh, so as you try to convince others, your peers, to use Scala, um, generally, you know, in, in a hostile environment, you're either going to get people who are kind of dismissive and say, like, it's too academic for me, not my thing, or you're the Scala guy, I don't need that. Um, saying things like, no, but it'll make your job easier. Uh, that's, uh, that's guaranteed to fail because people don't want to be told what to do uh, or they don't want to be told that uh, what, what they're doing isn't great uh, or, or maybe could be optimized. What's generally more successful, at least I've found, um, and we have uh, uh, a, couple, a couple of people from, from my, my team here today uh, for support, so thank you for that, um, is uh, to try to build a culture around uh, don't, dive, don't try to dive right into a project. Don't go to your manager and say, uh, I, uh, I really want to do this next project in Scala. I'm excited to learn it. Um, because the manager, the first thing a manager is going to say is, uh, well, after I fire you, who's going to take over that project, right? <laughs> or basically, after you leave or when you're not available, who, who's going to support it, right? Because the manager is not thinking, generally thinking about your own well-being and your own self-satisfaction. They want to know, okay, as a whole, what's the team going to do here? Who else is going to do it? Um, so you need, you need a culture behind you. And a, a good way to do that is to just basically say, basically start saying, like, I'm, I'm learning Scala. If anybody wants to, it's like, uh, uh, it's, it, I should have thrown the slide in here now that I'm thinking about it. But it's like Homer when he said, uh, all right, Pi, I'm just going to start moving my mouth like this. And if you end up in it, that's your own fault. Um, it's the same kind of thing where you're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here at a specific time. 
um, you know, just futzing around with Scott. If anyone wants to join, I mean, please do. Uh, and then, you know, you might get some magnet, you know, magnetic uh, attraction from there. Um, for us, we dubbed it Coding Fun Time, and we ultimately built a ray tracer from the ground up. If you look at the actual code, you will say, like, well, that looks like a Java programmer wrote that. And that's true. Uh, we were Java programmers at the time we, we, um, we wrote this. And we wrote it like Java programmers. But that's fine, because we weren't doing it alone. We actually had five. And five was our magic number um, for uh, a co-supportive group, um, something where if I, uh, for several weeks, I was not around, the group would continue. And uh, maybe it would just be two people who met or three people, or one person, but um, the, it lives on with, without me or you specifically. And that's really what you kind of want, is a self-sustaining group that's going to continue. No project work yet, right? This is just learning. We're just learning. Uh, but we're kind of learning on the company sly, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so uh, the next step, after you kind of figure out, like, OK, there's enough catching on here where we can actually compile Scala and write it like Java programmers, but we realize that we'd be embarrassed to show an actual Scala person this. Um, that's when the idiomatic piece comes up. And that's when you actually start thinking, maybe we should learn about this functional programming thing. And I'm reminded of, uh, of, a, of epiphanies, right? So, or um, uh, what's another word for epiphany? Um, re real revelations, realizations. So. Um, I remember my mentor when I was in my first or second year of programming, uh, he just kind of offhandedly said, uh, he's like, well, yeah, every time you have an if statement, that's usually an indication that there's a more object-oriented uh, solution uh, you know, at hand there. If statements are a uh, code smell. And at the time, I was like, yeah, I, I know, totally. Um, but uh, I had no idea what he's talking about. So, um, but... Of course, this turns into just general polymorphism after a while. But the point is, you feel like you're an object-oriented programmer, and then someone drops something like that on you, and you're like, yeah, OK, yeah, I got you. Uh, and you actually internalize it and use it. It's the same thing with functional programming, where you can kind of do all the intro stuff and say, yeah, functional programming. Uh, well, functional state is bad, right, with functional programming. So I guess I'm just going to be a bad functional programmer because I need state. But it turns out that's not true. Um, and this was, an, uh, this was a personal point of epiphany for me, was uh, state is not at odds with functional programming. Side effects might be, but not state. And when you get state in the mix, you get repeatability, and you get uh, usefulness. And you can actually start doing things and testing things. Um, I did not. Uh, come up with that um, myself. Um, that was uh, I. And if you read, if you read one book this year, um, this is a great book. This functional programming in Scala. I feel like I'm late to the party. This one's been around for a while, uh, and this came up in another talk, uh, and everybody was like, "Oh yeah, I, I have my copy or whatever." But anyway, in case you're late to the party like me, this is a great book. Uh, it, it builds functional programming kind of from first principles. And I, I kind of like that. So after a while, over all that, you, uh, you start thinking functionally and things, but you are, and you already know the Scala syntax. You already have a support group. You have people of like-minded uh, intention. And uh, you have this positive feedback loop that starts. And you feel like, I'm ready to do something. I'm ready to do an actual project. And you, and you wait, and you remember you're in this corporate environment, and there's, you're in your cubes, and there's a lot of risk, and we're a Java shop, and uh, projects are coming, but I'm just kind of waiting in the slide, building this team in stealth, um, figuring out functional programming. And then finally, a project comes. And, uh, you know, and it fits right in with where you want, what you want to do. And yeah, you could do it in Java, but maybe there's this little thing that makes it a little bit more compelling to do in Scala. And you got your team all ready to go. And now it's time to go to management. So um, these dour looking people um, uh, are not going to care about Scala. And they're not going to care about your satisfaction. They're not going to care about your team. And, I, and I, I mean this like we all care about each other's human beings. But your manager has different concerns than you do. This is what your manager cares about. Your manager cares about pie charts and bar charts and jokes from XKCD. No, 
I'll let you read it. Yeah, you'll read it on the slides. So um, they're going to care about things like this. And this is a great slide because it looks like Scala has taken off. It's dominating. But the, uh, the parentheses here, if you look at the, comp the competition here, I mean, the, co the, the parentheses is in the small world of functional programming. So um, yeah, Scala is taking off. There are two more jobs this year than there were last year. So, uh, but that's okay. It's still a compelling chart. Um, and you know, this is from the uh, Stack Overflow developer survey. You know, you, you can't really use this stuff, but managers don't know that. You could just kind of give it to them and say, like, look, it's the fourth most loved language. People really love this stuff. Um, and you know, here's the the Red Monk thing that comes out every quarter, and Scala is always trending up, kind of toward toward there. Um, and that's that's all well and good. But the, uh, the, the, the problem with this is a manager is going to want to know, like, fine, can I hire Scala developers? I'm like, well, you, you, I mean, you, technically. I mean, people put it on their resume. <laughs> but, um, but good news, you don't have to hire them. I got these guys all ready to go, and we've been doing this thing. You've been doing this on company time? It's like, oh, you're asking too many questions. So, um, <laughs> but you know, the idea is, you, you, the point is, with managers, you have to know your audience. You win managers with data, with don't worry, this is not risky. This is just Java. Uh, it, it lives on Java, it compiles down to Java, it plays well in our system. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and the team will do it. And you know, we've got, we, don't, we already know it. We know it well enough to, learn, uh, to use it. And it's a small project. It's very self-contained. So you've passed the second hurdle. You got people, you got management buy-in, which really just means uh, they'll approve your timesheets. Now, where, where, what's the block you hit with, um, with a corporate world? If you get management buy-in and you got your developer peers, there's still someone you need to win over. And that's, uh, that's these guys. So um, hopefully, the only way this is going to work with your ops guys, with your DBAs, with your, uh, uh, um, with your ops guys, and your, um, your, your system engineers, basically, um, the only way that they will give you the time of day is if you have uh, DevOps. So um, I hate to say, like, you, know, you got DevOps, right? Because everybody's doing DevOps. Because DevOps doesn't mean anything. But what I mean here is, uh, is continuous delivery. So you've got some amount of deployment pipeline. You're not just ad hoc throwing jars into production or in different environments. If you have an actual deployment pipeline, that loves and understands Java and other things. And this is, I guess, you know, Docker can come into this, but um, at CME, we don't use Docker. We, we have our own, of course, CME um, does everything from scratch by itself because that is the least efficient way to do it. And I'm glad this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> so we, <laughs> we write our own tools, thank you very much. And they love Java. Uh, but with, that's, a good, that's good news, because what do you tell your ops guys? Oh, it's just Java. It's just, you're going to see Scala all dot jar in there, but it's just, it's just a jar. It's whatever. Um, and we actually have a production support team. When things, go, when things throw exceptions in production, because the markets are open 24 or 7, um, the, the production support team is going to get it. They're going to see stack traces, and they're going to have Scala package names in there. But that's OK, because you take them out to coffee, and you say, like, it's, you, you read it just like Scala. You read it just like Java. I mean, you know, here, it, it's basically the same thing. So um, that's actually usually, in my experience, that's not a very difficult sell uh, because of the Java linkage there. Uh, and if you're lucky and if you're doing great, and I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to blow through this, um, you get to do an actual project. And that's, uh, that's kind of the culmination. This is not a case study. But if it were a case study, this is where that talk would start, which is, uh, this is uh, a project we were able to do with a team of five developers, um, a, a market state service, um, microservice. Uh, uh, with, with Akka, it was heavy, heavy with the uh, message passing uh, and concurrency and persistent data structures. And there isn't a synchronized keyword in, in the house. Uh, and uh, you know, was it great? I don't know if it was great, but it was ours. You know, it was it was a child that we that we loved. So, uh, but but what's important is there's this application out now in our pipeline 
the, the trail has been blazed for future projects to come through. There is now, and, and our information security guys wanted to know like, well, we scan all the code and we don't know how to scan Scala code, so we don't know if your code is secure. Um, and I'm like, well, it sounds like you've got a problem then, <laughs> InfoSec, because there's gonna be more of this stuff coming down. Um, don't ever talk back to InfoSec, but uh, you get the idea. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of where we ended up and the journey we took to get there. Um, so, uh, so thanks for going on this, this journey with me. I don't have a summary slide. All I have is kind of, I, I usually end with some sort of like, um, I've been at this for 20 years, maybe I'll be at it for 20 more years, um, kind of reflection on my own mortality. Uh, but I realize that there are fewer lines of code uh, uh, ahead of me than behind. Uh, and this is the classic uh, Olin Mills uh, 80s picture. I'm the, I'm the attractive guy in the, up there on the top. Um, and you know, this was right around when I started getting into programming on the Apple IIe. Uh, and, um, and, I, and I begged my dad for a computer and my dad uh, was a truck driver at the time and he's like, what do you need computers for? There's no future in that. Um, but uh, eventually we got a hand-me-down uh, Texas or TI-89, I think it was. Um, and it, had, it, was, it was the cartridges. Uh, you could save programs if you had an actual tape recorder with a, with a, with a uh, plug that would plug in and a tape, a physical tape, a magnetic tape, and it would take five minutes to save your five-line program. Uh, but we didn't have the cable, we didn't have a tape recorder, so I would type in the same program, turn the power off, it's gone. Um, next, you know, and so basically no persistence whatsoever. Uh, and then, uh, and, you know, and finally, you know, over the years, I, you know, my dad's like, you sure do like this programming thing, huh, boy? <laughs> and uh, my dad doesn't talk like that at all. Um, but, uh, but eventually, uh, you know, I got into Java and all that. And I wonder kind of, um, you know, I see kind of the horizon. You know, my ship has sailed. I might be a full-up functional programmer, maybe. Um, but I'm kind of, you know, my, my, I've had my day. And I kind of wonder, like, where, where are we leaving for the next generation, right? These are my girls. This is after they saw the movie Gravity. I don't know if you remember that movie. Um, so they're, they're playing there. Holly, Holly's about to go into orbit, and Meredith's holding her back. Um, and Holly didn't dress up for this, by the way. This is just how Holly dresses. So, um, but, but uh, you know, the next generation of developers, you, know, the, you know, my team, and then after my team, um, matures and the and and the the values that they instill are they going to instill object oriented you know like Java it's just what we got it's fine you you deal with it or is it more of a you know there's a lot this functional programming idea it's got legs there's a lot of elegance in this language the Scala um, so uh, that's I guess the 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 final thought I would leave for you and I hope uh, that it was a positive thought because now you have to rate it so um, try to think back on the session. Uh, the most positive memory you have from it, and channel that, uh, and then reach for the rating. So that's all I have. Thanks for listening. I'm over time. Um, you can applaud now, and then I'll ask for questions. All right, I'll just ask for questions. Who's got questions? This is it. I'm done. This is this is it. Yep. 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 So, so in total, how much time? Did for me personally, or the team that I was talking about. The team personally was about, I would say, eight months, eight months or ish. And this was after a lot of false starts. Earlier, when I said build a Scala team in five years, that was a five-year journey for me personally to try to kind of kindle or you know to like ignite interest. And we wrote some tools, and people would modify them, and they'd leave the company or it wouldn't do anything. Um, but this is the first time something stuck to actually go into production. And for better or worse, it lives in the world now and has to be maintained and modified. And we still have active interest in it. So let's call it eight months, over a five-year trial. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I should probably repeat the question. But um, is there more momentum now that this thing is out? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So um, it, you know, the path is there. Um, my, my management doesn't have to be sold on the Scala thing anymore. And in fact, it's more of a like, oh yeah, are you, are you gonna do this in Java or Scala, do you think? Oh, oh Scala, okay, that's fine. Um, there's more momentum for actually hiring Scala developers because we have, we can interview now. <laughs> and 
we don't have to take their word for it that they know what they're doing. Um, and uh, it's really, uh, it's all about the culture and, and you know, that, that team of five and hopefully growing um, people who are invested in it. And if I leave the company or get, you know, just go my own way, uh, I, I feel like that will continue. And I feel like that's the key there, so thanks. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So the question is: Is there is there kind of more of a appetite for like the Docker, Mesos, Kubernetes of the world over like the homegrown stuff, sort of? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Reluctantly, yeah. Uh, I mean, specific. Well, specifically where I work. I mean, if you go to conferences, it's very clear. Like, oh yeah, everybody everybody's using Docker. Clearly, <laughs> I mean, like it's very. It's, it seems like a very hot technology right now. Um, but yeah, there is some tepid introduc introduction to it. The, the thing is, because I work for a financial exchange, we're highly regulated, uh, especially in the deployment pipeline, subject to audits. You have to be really careful, and you kind of need tight control over your, your deployment pipeline. But yeah. Any, anyone else? Cool. Well, thanks. I really enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed this. Like I said, it's my first Scala talk. Uh, at a Scala conference, and I, I think I had a lot of fun. I hope you had a, a good time listening to it as much as as I enjoyed writing it. So, so thanks. Cool.